Visualization, visual representations of data and information. One before you begin your study. During the course of this unit, your study will involve following links to external websites and resources. In places the material is open-ended in what it asks you to do. In addition, there are several optional activities that may interest you at the end of this part to allow you to explore this topic in more detail. Aim to spend about 8 hours in total on the core material. In places the material relies on your exploring a variety of online active tools for yourself. Some of the suggested tools may require you to register for an account. If you do register a new account on these services, take care not to share personal information you are uncomfortable with sharing, and do not reuse a password that you use elsewhere. If a service requires an email verification before you can use the service, you could if you wish use a disposable email address search for disposable email address using your favorite search engine. These email addresses last long enough for you to pick up an email that is sent to them immediately, but then they disappear. Note that if you register with a service using a disposable email address and want to reuse that service at a later date, it will not be able to email you a replacement password if you have forgotten the one you originally registered with. If a service asks for a date of birth for no particularly good reason, you could if you wish invent a web birthday for yourself. A date you can remember that is not your real birthday. 1. 1. An introduction to visualization. Activity 1. Exploratory. Before you go any further, watch the following video presentation by Hans Rosling, Professor of International Health at Sweden's Karolinska Institute. It lasts about 20 minutes, and will show you very clearly just how powerful visualization can be. Transcript About 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa, so I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. But when you get that opportunity, you get a little nervous. I thought, these students coming to us actually have the highest grade you can get in Swedish college systems, so maybe they know everything I'm going to teach them about. So I did a pretest when they came. And one of the questions from which I learned a lot was this one. Which country has the highest child mortality of these five pairs? And I put them together, so that in each pair of country, one has twice the child mortality of the other. And this means that it's much bigger a difference than the uncertainty of the data. I won't put you at a test here, but it's Turkey, which is highest there, Poland, Russia, Pakistan and South Africa. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I did it so I got the confidence interval, which is pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. A 1. 8 right answer out of 5 possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health, laughter and for my course. But one late night, when I was compiling the report I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. Laughter because the chimpanzee would score half right if I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey. They would be right half of the cases. But the students are not there. The problem for me was not ignorance. It was preconceived ideas. I did also an unethical study of the professors of the Karolinska Institute laughter that hands out the Nobel Prize in medicine, and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. Laughter this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate, because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. We did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. This country over here is China. This is India. The size of the bubble is the population, and on this axis here I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin, mainly. Laughter and they said, the world is still we and them, and we is western world and them is third world. And what do you mean with western world? I said. Well, that's long life and small family, and third world is short life and large family, so this is what I could display here. 
I put fertility rate here. Number of children per woman, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to about 8 children per woman. We have very good data since 1962 to 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries, the error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. In 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? Is it still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see. We stopped the world then. This is all you, N, statistics that have been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China there, moving against better health there, improving there. All the green Latin American countries are moving towards smaller families. Your yellow ones here are the Arabic countries, and they get larger families, but they, no, longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here. They still remain here. This is India. Indonesia's moving on pretty fast. Laughter and in the 1980s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there. But now, Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 1980s. The Imams start to promote family planning. They move up into that corner. In the 1990s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of them move up into the corner, where we have long lives and small family, and we have a completely new world. Applause let me make a comparison directly between the United States of America and Vietnam. 1964, America has small families and long life, Vietnam had large families and short lives. And this is what happens. The data during the war indicate that even with all the death, there was an improvement of life expectancy. By the end of the year, the family planning started in Vietnam and they went for smaller families, and the United States up there is getting for longer life, keeping family size. And in the 1980s now, they give up communist planning and they go for market economy, and it moves faster even than social life. And today, we have in Vietnam the same life expectancy and the same family size here in Vietnam, 2003, as in the United States, 1974, by the end of the war. I think we all, if we don't look in the data, we underestimate the tremendous change in Asia, which was in social change before we saw the economical change. Let's move over to another way here in which we could display the distribution in the world of the income. This is a world distribution of income of people. One dollar, ten dollars or one hundred dollars per day. There's no gap between rich and poor any longer. This is a myth. There's a little hump here. But there are people all the way. And if we look where the income ends up, the income, this is 100% the world's annual income. And the rich is 20%, they take out of that about 74%. And the poor is 20%, they take about 2%. And this shows that the concept of developing countries is extremely doubtful. We think about aid, like these people here giving aid to these people here. But in the middle, we have most of the world population, and they have now 24% of the income. We heard it in other forms. And who are these? Where are the different countries? I can show you Africa. This is Africa, 10% the world population, most in poverty. This is OECD, the rich country, the country club of the U.N. And they are over here on this side, quite an overlap between Africa and OECD. And this is Latin America. It has everything on this earth, from the poorest to the richest, in Latin America. And on top of that, we can put East Europe, we can put East Asia, and we put South Asia. And how did it look like if we go back in time, to about 1970, then there was more of a hump. And we have most who lived in absolute poverty were Asians. The problem in the world was the poverty in Asia. 
And if I now let the world move forward, you will see that while population increase, there are hundreds of millions in Asia getting out of poverty and some others getting into poverty, and this is the pattern we have today. And the best projection from the World Bank is that this will happen, and we will not have a divided world. We'll have most people in the middle. Of course it's a logarithmic scale here, but our concept of economy is growth with percent. We look upon it as a possibility of percentile increase. If I change this, and I take GDP per capita instead of family income, and I turn these individual data into regional data of gross domestic product, and I take the regions down here, the size of the bubble is still the population. And you have the OECD there, and you have Sub-Saharan Africa there, and we take off the Arab states there, coming both from Africa and from Asia, and we put them separately, and we can expand this axis, and I can give it a new dimension here, by adding the social values there, child survival. Now I have money on that axis, and I have the possibility of children to survive there. In some countries, 99.7% of children survive to 5 years of age. Others, only 70. And here it seems there is a gap between OECD, Latin America, East Europe, East Asia, Arab states, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. The linearity is very strong between child survival and money. But let me split Sub-Saharan Africa. Health is there and better health is up there. I can go here and I can split Sub-Saharan Africa into its countries. And when it burst, the size of his country bubble is the size of the population. Sierra Leone down there. Mauritius is up there. Mauritius was the first country to get away with trade barriers, and they could sell their sugar. They could sell their textiles on equal terms as the people in Europe and North America. There's a huge difference between Africa. And Ghana is here in the middle. In Sierra Leone, humanitarian aid. Here in Uganda, development aid. Here, time to invest. There, you can go for a holiday. It's a tremendous variation within Africa which we rarely often make, that it's equal everything. I can split South Asia here. It is the big bubble in the middle. But a huge difference between Afghanistan and Sri Lanka. I can split Arab states. How are they? Same climate, same culture, same religion. Huge difference even between neighbors. Yemen, civil war. United Arab Emirate, money which was quite equally and well used. Not as a myth is. And that includes all the children of the foreign workers who are in the country. Data is often better than you think. Many people say data is bad. There is an uncertainty margin, but we can see the difference here. Cambodia, Singapore. The differences are much bigger than the weakness of the data. East Europe, Soviet economy for a long time, but they come out after 10 years very, very differently. And there is Latin America. Today, we don't have to go to Cuba to find a healthy country in Latin America. Chile will have a lower child mortality than Cuba within some few years from now. And here we have high income countries in the OECD. And we get the whole pattern here of the world, which is more or less like this. And if we look at it, how it looks, the world, in 1960, it starts to move. 1960, this is Mao Tse Tung. He brought health to China. And then he died. And then Deng Xiaoping came and brought money to China, and brought them into the mainstream again. And we have seen how countries move in different directions like this, so it's sort of difficult to get an example country which shows the pattern of the world. I would like to bring you back to about here at 1960. I would like to compare South Korea, which is this one, with Brazil, which is this one. The label went away for me here. And I would like to compare Uganda, which is there, and I can run it forward, like this. And you can see how South Korea is making a very, very fast advancement, whereas Brazil is much slower. And if we move back again, here, and we put on trails on them, like this, you can see again that the speed of development is very, very different, and the countries are moving more or less in the same rate as money and health, but it seems you can move much faster if you are healthy first than if you are wealthy first. And to show that, you can put on the way of United Arab Emirate, that came from here, a mineral country. 
They catched all the oil. They got all the money. But health cannot be bought at the supermarket. You have to invest in health. You have to get kids into schooling. You have to train health staff. You have to educate the population. And Sheikh Sayyid did that in a fairly good way. And in spite of falling oil prices, he brought this country up here. So we've got a much more mainstream appearance of the world, where all countries tend to use the money better than they used in the past. Now, this is, more or less, if you look at the average data of the countries. They're like this. Now that's dangerous, to use average data, because there is such a lot of difference within countries. So if I go and look here, we can see that Uganda today is where South Korea was 1960. If I split Uganda, there's quite a difference within Uganda. These are the quintiles of Uganda. The richest 20% of Ugandans are there. The poorest are down there. If I split South Africa, it's like this. If I go down and look at Niger, where there was such a terrible famine, lastly, it's like this. The 20% poorest of Niger is out here, and the 20% richest of South Africa is there, and yet we tend to discuss on what solutions there should be in Africa. Everything in this world exists in Africa. And you can't discuss universal access to HIV medicine for the quintile up here with the same strategy as down here. The improvement of the world must be highly contextualized, and it's not relevant to have it on regional level. We must be much more detailed. We find that students get very excited when they can use this. And even more policy makers and the corporate sectors would like to see how the world is changing. Now, why doesn't this take place? Why are we not using the data we have? We have data in the United Nations, in the national statistical agencies and in universities and other non-governmental organizations. Because the data is hidden down in the databases. And the public is there, and the internet is there, but we have still not used it effectively. All the information we saw changing in the world does not include publicly funded statistics. There are some web pages like this, you know, but they take some nourishment down from the databases, but people put prices on them, stupid passwords and boring statistics. Laughter applause and this won't work. So what is needed? We have the databases. It's not the new database you need. We have wonderful design tools, and more and more are added up here. So we started a non-profit venture which we called, Linking Data to Design. We call it Gapminder, from the London Underground, where they warn you, mind the gap. So we thought Gapminder was appropriate. And we started to write software which could link the data like this. And it wasn't that difficult. It took some person years, and we have produced animations. You can take a data set and put it there. We are liberating you, N, data, some for you, N, organization. Some countries accept that their databases can go out on the world, but what we really need is, of course, a search function. A search function where we can copy the data up to a searchable format and get it out in the world. And what do we hear when we go around? I've done anthropology on the main statistical units. Everyone says, it's impossible. This can't be done. Our information is so peculiar in detail, so that cannot be searched as others can be searched. We cannot give the data free to the students, free to the entrepreneurs of the world. But this is what we would like to see, isn't it? The publicly funded data is down here, and we would like flowers to grow up on the net. And one of the crucial points is to make them searchable, and then people can use the different design tool to animate it there. And I have a pretty good news for you. I have a good news that the present, new head of you. N. Statistics. He doesn't say it's impossible. He only says, we can't do it. Laughter and that's a quite clever guy, huh? Laughter so we can see a lot happening in data in the coming years. We will be able to look at income distributions in completely new ways. This is the income distribution of China, 1970. The income distribution of the United States, 1970. Almost no overlap. Almost no overlap. And what has happened? What has happened is this. That China is growing. It's not so equal any longer, and it's appearing here, overlooking the United States. 
Almost like a ghost, isn't it, huh? Laughter, it's pretty scary. But I think it's very important to have all this information. We need really to see it. And instead of looking at this, I would like to end up by showing the internet users per 1000. In the software, we access about 500 variables from all the countries quite easily. It takes some time to change for this, but on the accesses, you can quite easily get any variable you would like to have. And the thing would be to get up the databases free, to get them searchable, and with a second click, to get them into the graphic formats, where you can instantly understand them. Now, statisticians doesn't like it, because they say that this will not show the reality. We have to have statistical, analytical methods. But this is hypothesis generating, I and now with the world. There, the internet is coming. The number of internet users are going up like this. This is the GDP per capita. And it's a new technology coming in, but then amazingly, how well it fits to the economy of the countries. That's why the $100 computer would be so important. But it's a nice tendency. It's as if the world is flattening off, isn't it? These countries are lifting more than the economy and will be very interesting to follow this over the year, as I would like you to be able to do with all the publicly funded data. Thank you very much. Applause. Comment. We'll come back to the software Rosling used in his visualizations later on, but first we need to think a little more about visualization. What it is, what it can do for us and what sorts of visualizations are used and useful. Visualization is a process whereby data is represented in a graphical way in order to expose patterns and relationships that might otherwise be missed. If you look at a list of unordered numbers, such as the number of mobile calls per subscriber in a particular country over time, you may be able to spot a general increase in the number over that time interval just by casting your eye over the list of numbers. However, it is unlikely that you would spot more elaborate trends in the data, such as variations with the time of year, say. Or if you were given a list of numerical GPS coordinates, you would probably find it hard to work out the route that was actually taken, just from the list of numbers. Visualization can bring those numbers alive, and make those periodic trends, as well as the path taken on a GPS journey, self-evident. Activity 2 Exploratory Aim to spend about 5 to 10 minutes on this activity. Every so often, the Office of National Statistics on surveys a sample of UK households about, among other things, their use of the Internet Office for National Statistics, 2010. Skim through this UNS report on domestic Internet access for 2010, looking at the range of data tables it contains. As you do so, think about what sort of technique S might be appropriate to display the data shown in the various tables in a graphical way. Comment. You might like to return to this activity at the end of this unit and see to what extent you would want to change your answer as a result of what you have learned. As a discipline, visualization is rapidly evolving. More and more online and offline applications that are capable of visualizing data from data sharing applications such as online spreadsheets, databases and general data repositories are providing ever easier ways to visualize data for free. In the corporate world, so-called enterprise mazhub services offer ways of exposing business data to users who can then visually sit for a particular purpose, or to answer a particular question. Just as search engines like Google made it easier to search the web and discover relevant answers to particular search queries, so visualization techniques are providing ever more powerful ways of interrogating data and getting answers from it. Visual representations can also be misleading, though, and should be treated with caution, as should the data that underpins them. So let's make a start by looking at some very common visualization techniques, in the form of the most popular spreadsheet chart types, as well as seeing how not to present them. To the most common spreadsheet charts. In this section, I'm assuming that you are familiar with three types of charts provided by spreadsheets bar charts, pie charts, and line charts often referred to as line graphs or just graphs and know how to use a spreadsheet to produce them. Types of charts. Each chart type communicates information differently to the chart reader. Or should that be chart viewer? The terms will be used interchangeably. 
The pie chart, as shown in figure 1 and below, can be used to represent proportions of a whole. For example, if you have set of non-overlapping, percentage-based results that add up to 100, and not too many categories, it might be appropriate to use a pie chart to represent the results in a visual way. The bar chart, as shown in figure 1b below, can be used to compare data obtained from independent members of a set, such as the population size for each country in a set of countries in the European Union. The line chart, as shown in figure 1c below, is often used to plot the behavior of a numerical quantity over time in which case the data may be described as time series data. More generally, line charts can be used to plot two continuous variables against each other. Figure 1a a simple pie chart, b a simple bar chart, c a simple line chart. Description. This figure has three parts. Part A shows a circle divided into sectors of varying sizes. Each sector pie slice is filled in a different color. Part B shows a bar chart with vertical bars. The axes are not labeled and there are no units. The vertical axis has a scale from 0 to 400 with equal divisions at intervals of 100. Seven vertical bars are shown, each a different color and height. Part C shows a line chart with a set of axes that have no labels or units. The horizontal and vertical axes are both marked at intervals of 10 from 0 to 60. Various points are marked dots on the graph and these are joined by a straight line between each dot which results in a generally rising line. Activity 3 Self-Assessment Which chart type would you choose for each of the following data sets? The number of mobile phone minutes called in the UK recorded on a monthly basis over the last year. The number of mobile phone subscribers in the UK recorded on a monthly basis over the last year. The number of mobile phone subscribers in the UK recorded on a monthly basis over the last five years, with the purpose of revealing the trend and making a forecast for the next three years. The relative market share in terms of subscribers of the different mobile phone operators. Comment. Here are my answers, with reasons. A bar chart would be an appropriate way of displaying this information, on the assumption that usage in one month is independent of usage in another month. Although you could use a bar chart here, a line chart would be more appropriate, because a significant number of subscribers in one month are likely to be continuing subscribers from a previous month and so the number of subscribers in one month is not really independent of a number in the previous month. Line charts are the best adapted to revealing trends and making forecasts, so a line chart would be most suitable here. As we are talking about proportional market share that is, the share of the whole market held by each company it would make sense to use a pie chart to display this information, using separate segments for not more than the four or five dominant providers and a single other segment to represent the rest. 3. Cheating with Charts one of the reasons for using visualization is that it allows us to see what is going on in the data set by providing a shorthand at a glance way of exposing patterns or distributions where the patterns or trends are graphically self-evident. However, depending on the visual context the data is provided in, the visualization can sometimes be misleading. In this section, you'll see a few ways in which graphical representations specifically line charts, bar charts and pie charts may be deliberately or carelessly misleading, and do more harm than good in the sense of miscommunicating information rather than failing to communicate it at all. Before we get started, though, familiarize yourself with the range of ways in which people currently use bar charts, line charts and pie charts by trying the following activity. Activity 4 Exploratory Aim to spend around 5 to 10 minutes in total on this activity. Try the following image searches on Google Images, or an image search engine of your choice. First, bar chart on Google Images next, line chart on Google Images and finally, pie chart on Google Images. For each chart type, do the charts look broadly the same? What sort of variety is possible in the display of each chart type? Comment. You may have been struck by how much variation there was in the use of color and detail on the charts. You probably found that the quality and extent of labeling on the axes varied widely. You may also have found that some charts attempted to use 3D effects which look pretty at first glance, but at a second look may have become quite distracting and even hard to read. 3. 
1. Cheating with line charts. Line charts are often used to display the values of particular quantities, such as share prices, or sales figures, over a period of time. Such data is sometimes called time series data. In this section, you will see various ways in which time series data and other time order data can be charted and explored in a graphical way. In order for the line chart to be meaningful, the origin of the graph that is, the value on the vertical axis where it is crossed by the horizontal axis is often chosen so that the variation in the quantity being graphed fills the chart. This is particularly the case where the range of the chart of values that is, the difference between the highest and lowest values is much smaller than the magnitude of the values themselves. So, for example, in the chart in figure 2 taken from Yahoo! Yahoo! UK and Ireland, 2009 we see the value for the Barclays Bank share price in late 2008 and early 2009. The minimum price shown is around the 130 mark, and the maximum is nearly 190, so it makes sense to use a range on the vertical axis that is just a little larger than this. Figure 2 Barclays Bank share prices from November 10, 2008 to January 12, 2009 Yahoo! UK and Ireland, 2009 Description This line graph shows how Barclays Bank share price changed with time. The horizontal axis is labeled from November 10, 2008 to January 12, 2009 and is marked in units of date, from November 2008 to January 12, 2009, at intervals of one week. The vertical axis is not labeled and is marked in units of share price, from 110 to 190, at intervals of 10. The divisions on the vertical axis are gradually and evenly getting smaller as the share price increases up the vertical axis. The line is a series of short straight lines joined to form a continuous line. It starts at just below 190 for 10 November and falls to a low of around 130 between 17 November and 24 November. After that the line rises in a series of peaks back to nearly 190 on 12th January. If you compare the two charts shown in Figure 3 for two different periods in 2008, you should notice that the automatically displayed range of values on the vertical axis is different in each case. If you don't take care looking at the values on the vertical axis, you may fail to appreciate the difference in performance. You also need to be alert to the fact that the vertical scale in both charts is non-linear. This is particularly noticeable in the August to September chart on the bottom. The distance on the chart between the 440 and 460 lines is less than the distance between the 280 and 300 lines. Figure 3 Barclays Bank Share Prices In March and April 2008 Yahoo! UK and Ireland, 2009 Figure 3 Barclays Bank Share Prices In August and September 2008 Yahoo! UK and Ireland, 2009 Description In this figure there are two line charts. Both charts show how Barclays Bank share prices changed with time but over different time periods. The charts have different axes and scales. The top chart, the horizontal axis is labeled from February 28, 2008 to April 16, 2008 and is marked in units of date, from a short time before 3 March to shortly after 14 April, at intervals of one week. The vertical axis is not labeled and is marked in units of share price, from 390 to 520, at intervals of 20. The divisions on the vertical axis are evenly spaced. The line is a series of short straight lines joined to form a continuous line. It starts at 500 on 28 February and falls to just under 420 by 10 March. After that a sharp peak rises to 460 midweek and then falls back to below 400 by 17 March. From then the share price rises steadily with two small peaks to midweek 31 March after which it gradually drops until 14th April before rising again towards the end of the period. The bottom chart, the horizontal axis is labeled from August 14, 2008 to September 22, 2008 and is marked in units of date, from a short time before 18 August to 22 September, at intervals of one week. The vertical axis is not labeled and is marked in units of share price, from 260 to 460, at intervals of 20. The divisions on the vertical axis are gradually and evenly getting smaller as the share price increases up the vertical axis. 
The line is a series of short straight lines joined to form a continuous line. It starts at 350 on 14 August and falls to just under 320 by 21 August. After that it rises steadily to 360 after 1 September and then falls back sharply to below 320 by 7 September. From then, after a sharp rise, the share price rises and falls with a general downwards trend to midweek after 15 September, after which it rises sharply towards the end of the period. The effect of the nonlinear scale is even more marked if we look at the chart in figure 4, which is over the period September 2008 to January 2009. The horizontal lines are very much closer together near the top of the graph than they are near the bottom. But is a nonlinear scale like this misleading for a quantity like share prices? Figure 4 Barclays Bank share prices from September 2008 to January 2009 Yahoo! UK and Ireland, 2009 Description This line graph shows how Barclays Bank share price changed with time. The horizontal axis is labeled from September 1, 2008 to January 29, 2009 and is marked in units of date, from September 2008 to January 2009, at intervals of one month. The vertical axis is not labeled and is marked in units of share price, from 50 to 450, at intervals of 50. The divisions on the vertical axis are gradually and evenly getting smaller as the share price increases up the vertical axis. The line is a series of short straight lines joined to form a continuous line. It starts at just above 350 for September and shows a downward trend but with some sharp drops and other times when the line is horizontal or rises slightly. Two sharper drops stand out. Between early to mid-October the price drops from 350 to 200 approximately where the length of the graph line showing this drop is 1.5 cm. Secondly between mid to end January the price drops from 200 to 50 approximately where the length of the graph line showing this drop is 3 cm. Activity 5 Exploratory Looking at figure 4, which appears more dramatic. The approximately 150 pence drop in early October 2008, or the approximately 150 pence drop in January 2009? Is the nonlinear vertical axis misleading? To answer this, find the approximate percentage change in share value in each case. Comment. The later drop appears far more dramatic. In October the drop was about 150 pence from a starting point of around 350 pence, which is approximately 40. Whereas in January the drop was about 150 pence from a starting point of around 200 pence, which is approximately 75. So the January fall not only looks more dramatic on the chart, but is more dramatic. The nonlinear vertical axis is therefore not misleading, instead it has helped us to visualize the relative severity of the two falls in price. Activity 6 Exploratory Aim to spend about 5 to 10 minutes on this activity. Using an interactive line chart, such as can be found on TimeTrick or Yahoo! Finance or by use of the Timepedia Chronoscope, explore a range of time series data values over different time periods. By selectively choosing different periods of time, can you create different views of the time series data that appear to tell a different story from the one that is being told when you look at the data over a longer time period? If the website will permit it, also change the origin that is, the point at which the horizontal axis crosses the vertical axis. Comment. You probably discovered from your exploration that changing the period of time and changing where the axes cross can create graphs that give very different impressions. Activity 7 Self-Assessment For a price varying between 10,000 and 10,250, how might you produce a line chart that at first glance makes it appear as if the value is not changing much at all, the value is changing wildly, come on. Set the range of the vertical axis range to be 0 to 11,000. Set the range of the vertical axis range to be 9,900 to 10,300. It is frequently the case that several data series collected over the same period of time will be displayed on the same chart, often using a different color for the different data series. In such cases, the vertical axis scale may or may not be the same for each data series. 
It's worth bearing in mind that if a time series data plot is actually an average of two or more related data sets, it may well tell a misleading story. For example, the plot in Figure 5 of Google Search Trend data suggests that searches for flowers are popular three times in the first half of the year. Or maybe not, see also Figure 6. Figure 5 Google Worldwide Search Trend data for the query flowers throughout 2007 Google Trends description. This line graph shows how the number of Google searches for the word flowers changes with month of the year. The horizontal axis has no label and is marked in units of date, from January 7th to December 7th, at intervals of one month. The vertical axis is not labeled and has no units or scale. The line is roughly horizontal with two large and one small sharp peaks. The large peaks occur in mid-February and early May and the small peak in mid-March. Figure 6 Google US and UK search trend data for the query flowers throughout 2007 Google Trends. Description. This line graph shows how the number of Google searches for the word flowers changes with month of the year. There are two lines shown. A blue line for United States data and a red line for United Kingdom data. The axes are the same as for figure 5. Both lines are roughly horizontal, each with two sharp peaks. The blue line has two large peaks in February and May. These coincide with the two large peaks in figure 5. The red line has a smallish peak coinciding with the February large peak of the U.S. figures. The red line also has a larger peak coinciding with a small peak in early May in Figure 5. In Figure 6, which shows the search trends for flowers in the U.K. and the U.S.A. separately, we see that peaks in search volumes may be localized to particular countries. Here, Valentine's Day is common to both countries, but Mother's Day is celebrated at different times of year. There is some optional material on time series data in Section 9. 1. 3. 2. Cheating with bar charts. Bar charts are subject to various sorts of creative use. For example, the bar chart in Figure 7 shows huge differences in the four charted quantities, does it not? Or maybe not see also Figure 8. Figure 7 the values 235, 255, 270, 240 shown on a bar chart description. This vertical bar chart has four columns of varying height. The horizontal axis has no label and just shows each column labeled with a B, C and D from left to right. The vertical axis is not labeled and has no units, but the scale goes from 200 to 280 inches divisions of 10. The heights of the columns cannot be read accurately but are at approximately the following heights on the vertical axis. A 235B, 255C, 270D, 240. The overall impression is of quite large variation in bar heights. Figure 8 the values 235, 255, 270, 240 shown on a bar chart, but this time with the vertical axis starting at zero description. This vertical bar chart has four columns of varying height. The horizontal axis has no label and just shows each column labeled with a B, C and D from left to right. The vertical axis is not labeled and has no units, but the scale goes from 0 to 300 inches divisions of 50. The heights of the columns cannot be read accurately but are at approximately the following heights on the vertical axis. A 235B, 255C, 270D, 240. The overall impression is of quite small variation in bar heights. Many spreadsheet packages that are used to create charts also allow the user to employ shapes other than simple bars when constructing a bar chart. This may not be a good thing. For example, chart widgets like the ones shown in Figure 9 are available from Google Charts, as well as being potentially misleading because it's not immediately clear where zero lies. The train chart ranges from 200 to 270, whereas the piles of money chart ranges from zero to 270. The imagery can also be a distraction. Where different 2D shapes are used for the bars, the area of the shape may change out of proportion with the height or length of the bars, which would mislead the reader at the perceptual level.
When 3D imagery is used, the reader can be confused even unconsciously about whether the height or the volume of the chart is what is significant. Figure 9 of the values 235, 255, 270 and 240 represented by shapes. Here the different lengths of the two shapes used can mislead as can the fact the bars do not start at zero. Figure 9 be the same values represented by piles of money. Here the fact that there is a 3D representation is misleading. Is it height or volume that represents the four values? Description. This figure shows two charts designed with images of real items representing the columns. Chart A is similar to a horizontal bar chart. Each bar consists of a train locomotive and some carriages. Each bar has a label showing its length although there are no scales. From the top the lengths are a 235B, 255C, 270D, 240. Chart B simply shows some piles of money notes. Although differences in height of the money piles can be noted it is only possible to make very rough judgments about their relative heights. The piles are labeled from left to right. A 235B, 255C, 270D, 240. 3. 3 Cheating with Pie Charts Pie charts are some of the most commonly found graphical devices, although they can be difficult to read and are often misleading. Several commentators suggest they are always misleading, and that, because they only make visual sense for visualizing small data sets, it is often better just to use a numerical table. So what actually are they used for? Pie charts are charts that are used to represent the distribution of proportions of a whole. For example, if you conduct a survey of 100 people, you might use a pie chart to display how they answered a question of the form choose only and exactly one item from the following list, such as which brand did you buy in your most recent purchase of a mobile phone. However, if you then went on to ask an optional, yes, no question that only 27 of the 100 people were prepared to answer, representing the results from just those respondents in a pie chart would potentially be misleading. A reader might assume that the results applied to the whole survey population of 100. So in that case it might be better to show a chart with three sectors, one for yes, one for no, and one for did not answer. Changing the size of the whole referred to in different charts in the same report is one way of potentially misleading the reader of a report. But it is also possible to mislead readers in their perception of a single chart. For example, in the pie charts in figure 10, which sport has the biggest proportion, which has the smallest. Figure 10 to pie charts description. This figure shows two pie charts each divided into three sectors of red, blue and green. On both charts the red sector at bottom right is labeled soccer, the blue sector at top right is labeled rugby and the green sector at left is labeled cricket. The left hand pie chart is labeled 3D pie chart and has the appearance of a coin lying on a table where you can distinguish the top of the coin and the front edge. The right hand pie chart is labeled 2D pie chart and has the appearance of a coin standing on edge on a table where only the front face can be distinguished. In the 3D chart the sectors for rugby and soccer seem very similar in size and cricket appears smaller. In the 2D chart all the sectors appear very similarly sized. The actual distributions are Soccer 100, Rugby 90 and Cricket 80 inches a situation where 270 people were asked to choose their favorite among these three sports. In this case, the 3D chart does manage to suggest this, although the differences are harder to spot than in the 2D chart. However, it is also possible to orientate the 3D chart so as to make one sector appear larger or smaller than another, similarly sized one. And color can also have an effect on how we perceive the relative sizes. A full consideration of the perceptual effects that can be exploited to highlight particular results or even to attempt to mislead a reader when designing a chart will not be given here. And the lesson of section 3? Choose your axes, origins and color schemes carefully, and take particular care with 3D charts. If you want to be able to read actual data values, a table may be more appropriate than a visual representation. For hierarchical data, many data sets contain within them either explicitly or implicitly a set of structural relations between different parts of the data set. One common way of structuring data is in the form of a hierarchy, or family tree. 
Typical examples are organizational charts and library classification schemes. There is some optional material on creating organizational data in Microsoft Word and Google Spreadsheets in Section 9. 2. Hierarchical diagrams are also widely used as the basis of mind mapping tools, where child ideas are developed leading off from a central core topic. A mind mapping tool can provide a very good way of helping you unpack or explore an idea. There is some optional material in mind mapping tools in Section 9. 3. One of the problems with displaying hierarchies is that they can get very large and hard to display very quickly. There are several ways around this problem. For example, an interactive visualization can collapse each branch of a tree, hiding the sub-branches until you want to see them. In this sense, hierarchical organizations can also be thought of as containing sets of boxes within boxes. You may already be familiar with this sort of approach from your computer. Many file managers offer a hierarchical visualization of file organization through nested folders which you can open up or collapse as you wish. Figure 11 shows an example of this. Figure 11 an example of a hierarchical folder structure with some of the folders open to show their contents description. This figure shows a set of folder icons with some of the files having the contents showing as well. At the top left the highest level file is shown. To the left of each folder symbol is an arrowhead and to the right of the folder symbol is the folder's name. The top folder is called JIT. The arrowhead next to the JIT file points downwards indicating that the contents of that file are shown. In the next row down and set one jump to the right is another arrowhead with a folder symbol next to it and name next to that. Whenever an arrowhead points downwards the next level of folder or a file is shown underneath. Further down the figure, folders are shown with the arrowhead pointing to the right. In this case no further levels of folder are shown. At levels where there are no further folders, files such as main. CSS can be seen with appropriate icons. 4. One radial and hyperbolic trees. Sometimes, it is useful to be able to see the full hierarchy all in one go. One of the most efficient ways of doing this is to use a radial tree view. A radial tree plots the apex of the tree at the center of a circle, with the child branches radiating out from it. You can see it in this example of a radial tree view, which shows some relationships for the rock band Pearl Jam. Note that you can make one of the other nodes the center of the diagram by clicking on that node. Try clicking on, say, Eddie Vedder. A hyperbolic tree viewer works in much the same way as a radial tree viewer, but uses a different way of visualizing the links. 4. Two tremors. One colleague still talks about the impact of the first tremor he saw. It was in a blog post by book publisher Tim O'Reilly on the book Sales as a Technology Trend Indicator O'Reilly, 2005. It's shown in figure 12 below. The reason the trem app made such an impression on him was that one single diagram was capable of portraying several different sorts of information at the same time. The relative market share of different topic area systems in programming, business applications, and so on. The relative market share of different subtopics within each topic. The relative growth or decline in market share over the previous 12 months. Figure 12 O'Reilly Book Trend Trem app, taken from HTTP. Radar. Orly. Com O'Reilly, 2005 description. In this screen image a large rectangle is divided into a number of smaller rectangles, each with a label, and within each of those are a number of yet smaller rectangles varying in size. The smallest rectangles are colored either red or green and in varying shades from bright to dark such that the whole available space is covered in a patchwork of red and green rectangles. Each rectangle has a label. Some examples are Windows XP, Google, Microsoft Office and Photoshop. At the top of the window are various drop-down menus. Reading from left to right, interval currently showing quarter. Compare currently showing previous year. Measure currently showing units. View currently showing category. In addition, the controls at the top of the TREM app suggested it was an interactive tool that could potentially be used to explore the data in different ways the drop-down selection list boxes or maybe even filter out different results the 100 to plus 100 slider.
In short, the graphic was powerful and unambiguous, and communicated a lot of different information in one image. The suggestion was also there that the tool that generated it provided a powerful and intuitive way of exploring hierarchically structured data in a dynamic way. So let's see how the TREM app shown in Figure 12 depicts, at a glance, several different sorts of information at the same time. First, the relative size of the market for different categories of computer books. O'Reilly is one of the best known computer book publishers. The area of each rectangle reflects the relative sales volume of books in one category compared to the others. Second, the year-on-year -year change in the volume of sales per category. The chart shows this by using the dimension of color, with red being market decline and green being market growth. Activity 8 Exploratory Do a web or blog search for state of the computer book market to find the most recent O'Reilly review of the computer book market. Visit the review page, but before reading the commentary, just look at the trim apps that are presented, and write your own conclusions regarding what they say about the state of the market, then read through the commentary and compare the conclusions to your own. How intuitive did you find the trim app to read? Comment. Depending on your prior experience and how you respond to visual data, you may find trim apps intuitive to use or you may even find them confusing. Have you spotted that the data shown on TREMIPS can be hierarchical, though only to two levels? For example, Figure 12 has major categories of books sold, indicated by rather cryptic abbreviations such as SIS and PROG, WebDES and DEV, at the upper level. These refer to the window panes of the TREMAP the areas lying between the thick black lines. At the lower level in Figure 12 are the categories within these major categories. For example, within SICE and PROG are Java, C, C and so on. TREMIPS are a good way of exploring various types of hierarchically organized data. For example, Figure 13 shows a screenshot from the IBM NEI's visualization service, where a TREMAP has been used to represent the range of course units offered by OpenLearn during its first nine months of operation. Subject area describes the topic area of the course is released under. Original course describes the course code for the course that the open learn material was taken from. Unit code is the course unit identifier for each course on open learn. By rearranging the order of the headers, the TREM app can be used to create different hierarchical views of the data, views which might be used to explore the data, or even potentially provide an interactive navigation menu for the materials. Figure 13 TREM app of open learn course materials many eyes, N. D. Description. This screen image has the heading visualizations, open learn course units trim app demo. Here a large rectangle is once again divided into several smaller ones which are then subdivided again into many smaller rectangles. Each of the medium rectangles is a different color pale shades of turquoise, blue, peach, yellow, purple, green and labeled with a different subject area science and nature, society, mathematics and statistics, arts and history, education and lastly IT and computing. Along the top of the window is a set of headers with the explanation trim app hierarchy drag to reorder. From the left the headers are subject area, original course, unit code, description, course title, tags. You can find tremips elsewhere on the web, either as working interactive tremips, or as simple images for example, search for tremap all one word using your favorite image search engine. One of the most compelling TREMIPS I have found is the Hive Group World Population TREMIP, which uses data from the CIA's online World Factbook to provide a highly interactive way of exploring world population data. If you are interested and have time, I recommend that you spend a few minutes looking at the Hive Group World Population Statistics TREMIP. Activity 9 Exploratory Either Go back to the Many Eyes site, find the Many Eyes description page about TREMIPS and read through it. Using this data set based on the medals from the 2008 Summer Olympics, see if you can create your own TREMIPS to display. The distribution of medals by country, ordered by medal type and discipline. The distribution of medals by discipline, ordered by country and discipline. The distribution of medals by discipline, ordered by country and medal type. Hint. Click on the big visualize button to load the visualization selection page. Then click on the big icon that depicts a tram app to create the tram app visualization.
you should now have a trim app visualization. Note that there may be some issues with running the Many Eyes trim app in certain browsers, including the possibility that your browser will hang. If this happens, force your browser to close using CTRL plus Alt plus Dell in Microsoft Windows or force quit in Mac OS X. Or, you may prefer to create a trim app from a data set you have uploaded to Many Eyes yourself, either using a data set of your own, one you have discovered on Many Eyes, or one you have located elsewhere. Take care uploading data to Many Eyes if uploaded there, it will be made public. Read the guidance notes at Many Eyes. Trim apps to see how to upload the data in an appropriate format. As well as the simple Trim app, many eyes can also be used to identify changes in data values in a way reminiscent of the Trim apps used in the O'Reilly State of the Book Market Reports, using the Trim app for comparison sometimes referred to as a change Trim app visualization. If you have a data set you think would benefit from visualization using one of these types of trim app, the guidance notes on many eyes explain how to prepare the data. Activity 10 Self-Assessment In what situations might you choose to use a hyperbolic pre-visualization? How might you use a trim app to display changes in a set of data over time? Comment the hyperbolic tree is ideal for dealing with large hierarchical data sets because it allows for the dynamic resizing of parts of the tree that are not currently in focus. So, for example, if you had a very large tree plotted out in a traditional 2D rectilinear tree view, you would either have to zoom into areas of the tree you were interested in to look at them, or scroll to the part of the tree you were interested in. The hyperbolic tree makes far more efficient use of space, and allows you to navigate the whole tree, even a large one, in quite a small viewing area. Tramips can be used to be displayed changes in data values between two points in time using the dimension of color. Typically, the most recent data set will be used to determine the area of each block, and the color then indicates the degree of change from the earlier data set. So for example, in the O'Reilly Book Sales Trim app, the area of each block represented the current year's sales, and the color was the percentage growth green or decline red in volumes from the previous year, with the intensity of the color indicating how large or small the change was. 5. Geographical Data Geographical data is, loosely speaking, data that relates to geographical coordinates and so can be plotted on a map. The wide range of online mapping tools now available means that it is possible to create a wide range of map-based representations from appropriate data sets very easily indeed. In this section, we will look at how to get data onto a map and then explore three different ways of visualizing data on a map. Proportional symbol maps, the rather exotic sounding corpus of maps, and heat maps. We'll also look at how the transformation of a map projection itself can be used to represent data in the form of a special sort of map known as a cartogram. But first some orientation. 5. One Maps on the Web At the start of 2005, Google launched an online mapping service originally known as Google Local, now known more widely as Google Maps. Within a matter of weeks, third-party developers began to work out how to access Google Maps programmatically and create map mashups that overlaid third-party data on top of the actual maps. Over the next few months, Google opened up an API and application programming interface that made it easier for developers to create their own annotated maps. Looking around the web today, there is a wealth of online mapping services, some of which are free, some of which can only be accessed on a commercial basis. Activity 11 Exploratory Aim to spend about 5 to 10 minutes on this activity. If the idea of online maps is new to you, spend 5 to 10 minutes familiarizing yourself with the capabilities of some freely available online maps, such as the level of detail they offer and how to navigate within them. For example, visit at least one of the following and see how many different ways you can locate your own home. Google Maps UK Open Street Mapping Maps a 3D map such as Google Earth or Microsoft Virtual Earth or Earth Browser or Worldwide Central. Note that your browser may need to install a plug-in if you try to use these 3D maps. Several more examples can be found from GoGeo. 
Up Higher Education Central Resource for Geospatial Information and Services. Go Geo! But please be aware that exploration of this database is optional though fascinating. Many mapping services are also available via mobile device web browsers. If you have a mobile device, you may find that it has a mapping application built in that is aware of your location, using phone mass triangulation, Wi-Fi IP address geolocation or an inbuilt GPS service. 5. 2. Making your mark plotting data points on a map. One of the easiest ways to plot location data onto a map is to add it as an overlay. That is, as a visualization layer that sits on top of the actual map image layer. Many web services allow you to place one or more markers on a map and save them so that they can be viewed on a map on the same website or another website at a later date. There's an example of this in Figure 14. Figure 14 Google Map overlaid with user-contributed markers depicting the whereabouts of listeners to the BBC World Service Program Digital Planet description. In this screen image a partial map of the world is shown with various markers on it. The top of the image shows the website named Digital Planet. Underneath to the left are some links to various related sites for example taking IT further and science and technology forum. In the center, above the map, is the heading show us your digital planet with the text we want to see your digital planet choose our map to show where and how you listen to the program. The map itself has tools to move the map to show other parts of the world and enlarge or reduce the map size. Two types of marker are shown. An orange pin shaped marker and a green arrow. Neither is explained in this image. Under the map is the text put yourself on the map. Map data can be syndicated, that is, pulled into a remote map, using a data exchange format that can encode geographical location information, such as the latitude and longitude of a point, and maybe its altitude above sea level. Two standards that have come to the fore on the geographical web are GeoRSS and KML. GeoRSS is a lightweight, emergent standard that extends the RSS syndication protocol with latitude and longitude coordinates. Many online mapping tools accept GeoRSS, which means that web publishers who publish their content via RSS feeds already can also push that content into a map-based display, if appropriate. A good example of a site that supports this approach is FLICKR, the online photo sharing site, which allows users to add location metadata to their photographs, describing the location where they were taken. This information can then be exposed via GeoRSS, or the FLICKR API, and used to create displays such as FlickrVision, which plots recently uploaded photos on a map. As with many online services, FLICKR publishes RSS feeds as GeoRSS if there is location data available for any of the photos listed in the RSS feed. A second, far more powerful, markup language is KML, once known as the Keyhole Markup Language. This language was originally created for use with the Keyhole 3D geographical visualization tool that has become Google Earth. KML is now an open geospatial consortium standard. As well as describing straightforward location information, KML is capable of representing lines and complex polygons that is, complex 2D and 3D shape overlays, as well as adding image overlays and carrying payloads such as HTML and embedded video players into geo-visualization tools. KML files are often published in a compressed form as KMZ files, which is why you'll often see Google Earth overlay files linked to files with the extension. KMZ rather than KML. Most services that are capable of accepting a KML file that is, that will plot the points and overlays described within a KML file can also read KMZ files. As an example, click the following link to load a KML. KMZ file of OU regional centers into Google Maps. There is some optional material on exploring KML further in section 9. 4. And some optional material on map overlaying skills in section 9. 5. 5. 3. Geocoding your data. 
Geocketing refers to the way in which the actual location of a data point in terms of latitude and longitude coordinates, map grid references, or some other reference scheme that allows the data point to be plotted on a map is obtained from the name of the location, its address, or its postcode. In turn, reverse geocketing refers to the process of taking a map location or coordinate and identifying the corresponding address, postcode or toponym that is, the place name. There is a wide variety of geocketing web services available that can accept either a single address or a set of addresses and return an appropriately geocketed result. Online map-based search tools all perform some sort of geocketing of addresses or postcodes in order to display locations on the map. For example, you could try typing an address you know into the search box on Google Maps or Yahoo! Maps does it locate the address properly? Although it is quite easy to find geocoding APIs for addresses in the USA, thus allowing the creation of applications that can automatically geocode everyday addresses, in the UK the Ordnance Survey and the Post Office have traditionally published UK geolocation data under commercial terms. However, with the move to open up public data it is now possible to access a range of geolocation services in the UK as linked data. Web developers typically access geocoding APIs in order to geocode locations in a programmatic way. The Yahoo! Placemaker API provides a location extracting and geocoding web service that can be accessed via a URL. Pass in an address, or a block of text containing a plus and M, and it will identify the address and return latitude and longitude data for it. Many social networks make use of geocoding services to allow users to search for people near a particular location. For example, here's a search on Twitter for people near the Open University's campus. Search Twitter for people near Walton Hall, Milton Keynes. 5. 4. Proportional Symbol Maps Proportional symbol maps, or more often proportional circle maps, associate a particular symbol, typically a circle, with a particular point on a map, such as the center of a city, or the capital city of a country. The diameter of the circle represents some function of the quantity being visualized. For example, the proportional symbol map in figure 15 depicts the number of internet users per country in 2007 data source CIA World Factbook. Map produced using many eyes. Figure 15 proportional symbol map of the number of internet users per country 2007 description. Here a screen image of a world map is shown with the brown dots of various sizes scattered over the map. The dot with the largest radius is on the USA and the next largest on China. There are some medium sized dots on India, Japan and some European countries with slightly smaller dots on the rest of the world. At the bottom left the key explains that dots represents millions of internet users per country. The largest dot represents 150 to 180 million users and the smallest 0 to 30 million. 5. 5 Coraplid Maps Coraplid maps are some of the most widely used maps for depicting country or region based numerical data on a map. Rather than using markers or proportional symbols to render information about a detasset in a visual way, coraplid maps use shading or different colors often along the spectrum to color well-defined geopolitical areas of a map, such as a country, state or county, according to a given detasset. For example, the coraplid map in figure 16 visualizes the same internet usage data that was used to illustrate the proportional symbol map data source CIA World Factbook. Map produced using many eyes. Figure 16 Coraplid map of the number of internet users per country 2007 description. This screen image shows the same world map as figure 15. Now however each country is shaded in various shades of brown. The darker the shade the higher the number of internet users. The key at the left hand side shows the shades of brown for the same groups of million users as before. As detailed before, USA has the darkest shading and China the next with India, Japan and some European countries clearly darker than, say, African countries. Activity 12 Exploratory Read through the notes on creating world map based visualizations on many eyes. Using this to tacit which is slightly more recent than the one used to produce figures 15 and 16, a detasset that you have found, or a detasset that you have uploaded, use many eyes to create both the proportional symbol map view and the coraplid map view of the data. 
Note that if you use the foregoing datasset you will have to resolve some incompatibilities between the country names in the datasset and those that the many eyes mapping tool expects. Mostly the suggestions of the dialog box are correct, but you will have to tell it, for example, that Burma is the same as Myanmar. How do the map views compare in terms of impact and ability to understand the story being told by the data compared to its numerical, tabular representation? How effectively does the Coraplit map communicate the relative extent of internet usage across the world compared to the proportional symbol map? What drawback do you think there could be to using proportional symbol maps? Comment. Both maps make it easy to see how the data values vary by country. You probably found that both of them had more impact and gave you a better understanding of the story being told by the data than did the tabular representation. To some extent the answer to this is personal. For example, if you are used to using maps where countries are colored to distinguish them then you may find the Coraplit of map easier to relate to. On the other hand, you may feel that too much significance is given to large countries whose colors tend to stand out more than do those of small countries in the Coraplit map and so prefer the proportional symbol map. The principal problem with a proportional symbol map occurs when the symbol size is large compared to the country size. If proportional symbols were used on a higher scale map, for example to display statistics about different postcode areas in a town or city, it might be quite hard to identify which particular area each symbol corresponded to, particularly if some of the symbols overlapped. Activity 13 Exploratory Now read Perceptual Scaling of Map Symbols, a blog post by John Crygear. How does our perception of area compare with the way we perceive length? What lessons do we need to bear in mind from a psychophysical point of view when choosing between the use of a Coraplit of map and a proportional symbol map? Comment. As with many other visualization techniques, the way we perceive Coraplit and proportional symbol maps can be influenced by perceptual psychological and other psychophysical factors. 5. 6. Heat a sample of maps. Commonly known as heat maps, density maps or a sample of maps use semi-transparent overlays above a map or other image such as a web page to show the density or frequency of events happening at each point on the underlying map. In contrast to a Coraplit map, where values are plotted for different predefined regions, heat maps show color-based contour lines that connect points of equal value. For example, figure 17, a house price heat map from house price, shows house price inflation in the northwest of England between May 2007 and May 2008. Figure 17 heat map showing house price rises in the northwest of England from May 2007 to May 2008 mouse price, 2009 description. This very busy screen image shows a patchwork of red, pink and blue areas of varying shades overlaying a map a part of the north of England. At the top there are four buttons and the text select transparency level with a button for 0, 30, 60, and 100. Under that are radio buttons with the text select data with a button each for the following choices. Average values new builds 1 year growth 5 years growth selected 10 years growth crime rate on the map town names can be faintly seen. At the bottom a key shows the percentage house price growth relating to each color. From the left, yellow indicates no data, dark blue minus 10. Through various shades of blue to pale pink for 3. Up to dark red for greater than 20. The hot colors reddish are naturally taken to mean areas where there was a high one-year growth in house prices and the cooler bluish colors to mean a lower increase in house prices over the same period or, indeed, a decrease. Heat maps have come to be widely used for plotting the incidence of crime within city confines, particularly in the larger U.S. cities. An initiative in 2008 required UK police forces to start publishing crime maps reporting on the level of criminal incidents within their own jurisdiction. Activity 14 Exploratory See if you can find the crime map published by your local police authority. If you don't live in the UK and don't have an equivalent where you live, you could try some UK city you may have visited. At the time of writing, the UK crime mapper is a good place to start. Does your local police authority use a heat map to display the results? If not, see if you can find a crime map that does use heat maps but don't spend more than 10 minutes on this activity. 
If possible, compare the crime heat map to a house price heat map for a similar area. From just the heat maps, does there appear to be any correlation between levels of crime and house price? Heat maps and density mapping techniques are also widely used for displaying radio propagation data and satellite coverage data. For example, the Saturday Beams website uses density mapping to plot geographical areas that are covered by particular communication satellites. Heat maps elsewhere. As well as being used as overlays on geographical maps, heat maps are also widely used to provide reports about website usage. Information can be collected at a crude level based on the links that users click through on a web page to produce a click density map, although it is possible to also track mouse cursor movements, or, in a laboratory setting, collect eye tracking data. Figure 18 shows the result of eye tracking and mouse clicking data collected and aggregated from multiple users of the Google website Enquiro Search Solutions, Incorporated, 2005. The hot spots red, orange and yellow colors are the places on the page that the users were looking at most, and the purple crosses show where users clicked on the page. Figure 18 Google Golden Triangle Enquiro Search Solutions, Incorporated, 2005 Description. In this screen image a Google search result is shown although the actual results cannot be distinguished. The page is colored from bright red through yellow to blue with a number of pink crosses showing. The main dark red area is a triangle at the top left hand corner. A larger pale orange triangular border fans out across the page with an even larger yellow triangular border next. Blue areas cover the remainder of the text on the left hand side. The center of the page where there is no text is black and then there is a further blue area to the right over the sponsored links list. The sponsored links at the top of the list on the left of the screen fall into the yellow or even orange area as well as supporting an understanding of user navigation behavior on websites. Eye tracking heat maps can also be used to understand better how people read from the screen. Activity 15 Exploratory Read F-Shape Pattern for Reading Web Content, an article by Jacob Nielsen. What do the eye tracking results suggest about how people read web pages? How does the visualization used in the Google Golden Triangle screen make this sort of generalized pattern of behavior apparent? Activity 16 Exploratory Suggest two drawbacks of each of Coropliv maps heat or Asopliv maps Comment The fixed area boundaries in a Coropliv map suggest a discontinuity in the values portrayed either side of an area boundary and different values of a measure within a geographical area are not shown The use of a limited color palette means that Coropliv maps are unable to depict a wide range of actual values Heat or Asopliv maps require a large number of data points in order to identify equal value lines of a particular measure. Heat maps cannot be used in cases where the data is largely discrete or discontinuous. For example, the course codes of open university courses being studied in households in a particular OU region. There is some optional material on web developer skills in Section 9, 6, 5, 7 cartograms. Cartograms are map projections in which the sizes of the countries depicted are dependent on the value of some statistical measure associated with that country. To a certain extent, Tremips use a similar approach in that the area allocated to a category is proportional to the relative value of a quantity associated with that measure. Figure 19 shows a cartogram of the world in which territory size shows the proportion of all telephone main lines that were found there in 2002 World Mapper, 2006. Here telephone main lineage refers the UN measure of telephone lines connecting a customer's equipment to the public switch telephone network. Figure 19 cartogram of mainline telephones 2002 World Mapper, 2006 Copyright 2006 SASI Group University of Sheffield and Mark Newman University of Michigan Description. Here a map of the world is shown in various bright colors with the different countries identified by the different colors. However the shapes of the countries are distorted. Whilst the shapes of North and South America are easily recognizable, Europe has become a group of large pink and red blobs. Africa has become relatively tiny and very thin and Japan has also grown hugely. Note that quantities in international comparative data may often be normalized. This means that they are not absolute values but are related to the population size itself. 
So, for example, a cartogram might display the number of mobile phones per 1,000 people, rather than the number of mobile phones in the country as a whole. Activity 17. Exploratory HTTP. NCGIA. UCSB. EDU. CCTP. Units. Unit 47. HTML. Moz form. HTML. The show. World Mapper is an online animated cartogram generator that will transform a traditional map to an exploded cartogram depicting one of several different data sets hosted on the show. World Site. World Mapper hosts a collection of several hundred different cartograms, some of which are reprinted in the Atlas of the Real World, mapping the way we live. Spend a few minutes exploring the cartograms on each site about five minutes for each site. How easy are the cartograms to understand? What drawbacks are there in using a transformation of country size and shape to communicate statistical measures about different countries, compared to using visualization techniques such as corp within proportional symbols maps within the context of a traditional map projection? Comment. One major drawback of cartograms is that by distorting the shape of a country, it can become unrecognizable, except in relative terms for example, I recognize country A, so that mangled shape next to it must be country B. In a corpleth or proportional symbol map, the map coloring or marker placement is typically applied to a map projection we are familiar with. Activity 18 Self-Assessment you have met several types of map-based visualization in Section 5. This activity enables you to test your grasp of their relative uses. What sort of map-based visualization might you use to display the following sorts of geographical data set? The approximate travel time to a college campus for students who live within a travel distance of 20 kilometers. The number of students in each of the universities in England. The average income in each district of a local city. Members of your social network who are online at the same time as you, come in. Heat maps are a good way of depicting travel time. For example, commuting time maps. If we assume a single location for each university, a proportional symbol map could be used to display the relative numbers of students at the different universities on a map. A corporate map using electoral ward or postcode boundaries could be used to display average income in different areas of a town or city if the data is available for those geographical areas. At a push, you might even get away with using a cartogram to display this information. A simple marker-based map could be used to display the location of your family and friends on a map. 6. Multidimensional data. Multi-dimensional data is data that spans several different dimensions, and potentially many different units of measurement. For example, national statistics for a country might cover birth rate, mortality rate, population size, mean income per capita, average carbon footprint per person, total GDP, total amount of electricity generated per capita, number of mobile phones per capita, and so on. Being able to visually several different dimensions of the same data set at the same time can often reveal startling insights about how the data may be correlated. You saw this in the presentation by Hans Rosling that you watched at the start of this unit. In this video Rosling is demonstrating the trendalyzer visualization, which has since come to be called a motion chart. Whoever thought a statistics talk could double up as a live performance. But did you notice what sorts of techniques Hans Rosling used to explain the story that the animated data was telling? Activity 19 Exploratory. Read six simple techniques for presenting data. Hans Rosling TED, 2006. This analyses Rosling's presentation, and in particular how he works with the visualization to narrate the stories the data tells. Then watch the video again. Transcript. About 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa, so I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. Comment. Even if you never have to give a live presentation about data, you may still be able to invoke some of the techniques if you ever have to provide a written explanation about a data set. 
The Trendalyzer software, also known as a motion chart that is used to create the gap minder presentation, works best with multidimensional sets of continuous numerical data collected over a long period of time that is, longitudinal data sets. Such data is often found in the social sciences, as Rosling's talk suggests. Activity 20 Exploratory there is a great deal of interesting data and many ways of visualizing on offer at the Trendalyzer site, so you should aim to spend as much as 20 to 30 minutes on this activity. Visit the Trendalyzer visualization tool that Rosling demonstrated and the UN data he visualized with it at GetMinder World. You might notice that the application actually provides different views over the data, either as a chart against user selected numerical axes or overlaid on a map. Using the Trendalyzer, see if you can spot any trends that relate some or all of internet usage, broadband subscription, mobile phone called cell phone in the application ownership and personal computer ownership. Hint. You can change what's plotted on the two axes by clicking on the little arrow alongside the axis label and then choosing from the list that will appear. Also use the Trendalyzer to look for relationships between these technological indicators and particular economic, trade, education or energy indicators. If you find any surprising or particularly interesting relationships using the Trendalyzer, save the URL of the visualization and share it in the unit forum, along with a brief explanation of what the visualization depicts and what you found to be particularly notable about it. Activity 21 Exploratory how many dimensions can the Trendalyzer visually simultaneously, and how can these dimensions be depicted? How does the Trendalyzer animation help you spot correlations or anomalies in the data presented? Comment. The Trendalyzer allows you to track data along five dimensions. The horizontal axis, the vertical axis, the size of each point that is, the bubble size, the color of each bubble, and time when you use the play function. You might also view the feature that allows you to identify what each individual bubble represents as giving you access to yet another dimension. There are many ways in which the Trendalyzer allows you to spot correlations or anomalies. For example, if all European countries are depicted by the same color of bubble then looking at how the bubbles of that color move over time will enable you to spot which countries are changing in the same way and which are changing in a different way. There is some optional material on further visualization skills in section 9. 7. 7 Some caveats. Here are a few final points about using visualization tools. First, as more and more use is made of interactive chart components, it is worth bearing in mind that something that is informative as an interactive component may not be so useful if it is printed out. Just as you should always write for an audience, so you should always write for your medium. When designing a data display you should be mindful of what you want it to communicate and the situations in which you want it to be meaningful. For example, the interactive UK stock price charts on Yahoo, finance charts, or the Timepedia chronoscope allow users to zoom into different areas of the chart and explore them interactively. If it's likely that an online document containing an interactive chart will be printed out, you may need to take care in configuring the chart or the print template for the document so that an appropriate view of the chart is displayed in the print version. Due consideration also needs to be paid to managing the expectations of the users. For example, if they use the interactive chart to display a particular view over the data and then print the document out, will the view they have selected be the one that gets printed out? Second, one of the potential problems with using data from public data sharing websites is that you can't necessarily guarantee the accuracy or authenticity of any particular data set. To be sure of the provenance of the data, you need to either download from a trusted site for original data such as the UK National Statistics website, the UK Government Data Repository, the World Bank, and so on or go to a trusted third-party site that in some way guarantees the quality of the data. This is where sites like the Guardian Data Store come in. Sites like these maintain directories of qualified or otherwise trusted data, as well as curating data themselves. They may even support closely integrated visualization tools. And finally, but very importantly, if you do download the data yourself from a website, with the intention of reusing it, then there may be licensing issues that restrict what you can legally do with the data. 
Further, if you use data from a third-party source, you should always reference it in the same way that you would reference a book or journal article that you may have quoted. 8. Conclusion One of the aims of this unit has been to open your eyes to some though by no means all of the visualization tools and techniques that are available today for visualizing data sets, from numerical data to geographical data. Along the way, you have also seen how many institutions and organizations, as well as individuals, are making their own data available so that other people can visually sit to suit their own needs. 9. Taking it further optional material. All of the material in this section is optional. If you choose to study any of it, you should be aware the time taken studying this section is not included in the study time for the unit as a whole. 9. One exploring time series data optional. This page expands on issues discussed in section 3. 1. If you would like to explore other Google search trends, you can find the tool here. Google Insights for search other sets of time series data can be found at Time Series Data Library a collection of time series data drawn from many different subject areas. Up National Statistics Online This is the UK's repository for national statistics, where you can find all manner of UK-related data if you search hard enough. Microsoft Data Depot an experimental service where users can upload, chart and explore their own personal data or telemetry data. Time Trick A site you may already have used, in Activity 6, for displaying and analyzing time series data charts. Several of these sites also provide closely integrated charting tools that let you explore the data in a visual way. Activity 22 Exploratory Choose one or more of the above websites and spend up to 15 minutes exploring what it offers. End of activity. 9. 2. Creating organizational charts optional. This page expands on issues discussed in section 4. If you use Microsoft Word and are interested in learning how to create organizational charts in it, you could look at Demo. Create an organization chart which you can find on the Skills for OU Study website. Demo. Create an organization chart. If you use Google Spreadsheets, you could look at Google's alternative way of creating organizational charts. How to create an organizational chart. 9. Three mind mapping tools optional. This page expands on issues discussed in section 4. If you have never seen or used a mind mapping tool, you may like to try one out. It can be helpful for note-taking, mapping out your understanding of a topic, or planning out the structure of a document or presentation. Search for the terms mind mapping application or mind mapping software with your favorite search engine to find a tool, and then familiarize yourself with the sorts of diagram these tools can produce to get you started. Two tools I particularly like are the Freeman Desktop Application and the Online Minimizer. Using whichever tool you prefer, see if you can create a simple mind map of the topics covered in sections 1, 2 and 3 of this unit. Related to mind mapping is concept mapping. The Open University's CME Research Department has led the development of Compendium, which is one such concept mapping tool. 9. For exploring KML further optional. This page expands on issues discussed in section 5. 2. If you are interested in exploring KML further, you can use the KML Interactive Sampler to see how KML files are structured, as well as how they are then rendered in Google Earth. KML Interactive Sampler. Please note that your browser may need to install a plugin in order to use this application. A wide collection of KML files can also be found on the Google Earth Outreach site. Google Earth Outreach. See if you can find a KML file that contains a list of UK TV and radio transmitters, and then visually it using an online map. 9. 5 Map Overlaying Skills Optional This page expands on issues discussed in Section 5. 2. In order to plot your own GRSS or KML feeds in Google Maps, use the same construction as I used for the OU data at the end of Section 5. 2. That is, start with HTTP, Maps, Google, Co, Uck. Maps, Q equal and then add the URL of your geo or SS data. Alternatively, you can simply paste the geo into the search box on Google Maps and click on search.
A similar approach is used by many of the other online mapping services. New mapping tools that make it easier to display data on maps are being developed all the time. Some examples are Open Heat Map Plot Spreadsheet Data Easily on a Map Geo Commons Upload Data and Create Interactive Maps UK Ordnance Survey Open Data. If you would rather work on maps at the programming level via the Map Service APIs, Abstraction provides a JavaScript abstraction layer over several popular mapping APIs. 9. 6 Web Developer Skills Optional This page expands on issues discussed in Section 5. 6. If you would like to create a click density map for a website you control, there are several services you can try for free. For example, Click Heat, Crazy Egg and Click City. How do you think that heat maps might be used to help in improving the usability of a website? In order to add rich visualizations and charts to your website, there are several frameworks and libraries available. Some examples are Google Chart Tools. Image charts create charts by passing data to an image server via a URL, and let it return the image file directly. Protovis JavaScript and SVG Visualization Library. GRAPHA JavaScript Chart Library. JQPlot one of several JQUERY plugins providing support for charts. Abstraction a JavaScript abstraction layer over several popular mapping APIs. The JIT JavaScript libraries with a particular emphasis on rendering hierarchical tree-based data structures. 9. 7 Further Visualization Skills Optional This page expands on issues discussed in Section 6. If you ever want to create trendalizer-style visualizations using your own data, use the Google Motion Chart gadget, either from within a Google spreadsheet or via the Google Visualization API. The Trendalyzer Google Motion Chart widget is also used as one of the visualization tools provided as part of the Google Web Analytics service. If you are interested in how the motion chart can be used in such a context, you can watch a demonstration video called Motion Charts in Google Analytics. It lasts just under three minutes. Motion Charts in Google Analytics With ever-increasing amounts of data being published, data handling and visualization skills, as well as knowledge of statistics, are becoming more and more important. To keep up with innovations in visualizations, the following blogs are well worth subscribing to. Information Aesthetics Information is Beautiful Dadists. Next Steps After completing this unit you may wish to study another Open Learn Study unit or find out more about this topic. Here are some suggestions. Representing and Manipulating Data in Computers T2242 Data and Processes in Computing M2631 Science, Maths and Technology. If you wish to study formally at the Open University, you may wish to explore the courses we offer in this curriculum area, Communication and Information Technologies T215 BSc Honors Computing and ITB62 Computing and IP. Or find out about studying and developing your skills with the Open University, who study explained skills for study. Or you might like to. Post a message to the unit forum to share your thoughts about the unit or talk to other open learners review or add to your learning journal. Read this unit.